Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Kat. And it might look a bit different because I am coming to you through Zoom today because I'm incredibly excited to say that we have got some very special guests who are going to be telling us all about the magic of Christmas. So I hope you will join me in welcoming Her Majesty Queen Victoria and His Royal Highness Prince Albert to our screens. Hello and welcome. Good evening, Dr. Cat. Good evening, Dr. Cat. It's such a joy to have you both here. And uh, for you, it is December 1848, is it not? Yes, it is indeed. And it's, uh, it's quite cold. Albert has been uh, ice skating on the frozen lake. I have. This morning, but uh, not yet snowy. Ah, and how has 1848 been for you both? <laughs> Well, a very difficult year, in fact, Dr. Cat. I'm sure you can't imagine how difficult a year it's been for us here in 1848. No, I'm sure that nobody in 2020 has any idea about what living through a difficult year could possibly be like. But why don't you tell us about your year? Yes, I'm sure that the future is a very delightful place, but we have a, a rather um, while to go before then, of course. Uh, yes, we have had some uh, troubles in this year of 1848. Uh, there has been many revolutions in, uh, in Europe, notably in, in Germany and in, in France and here in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. Uh, and uh, we have had um, a difficult time trying to lift the spirits of the people. Mm. I, 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 I fear that many of my audience will be, of course, aware of the revolutions that have happened perhaps on the continent. But what has occurred in 1848? Because you sit here quite happy and hale and hearty. Uh, what, what was going on this year? Well, I wouldn't say happy. In fact, uh, I've written in my diary how miserable I am, but I am trying to lift my spirits as it is the, uh, the festive season. You see, it is the Chartists. There is a great movement uh, here in mm. Britain. It has, um, it has been bubbling uh, for the last couple of years, in fact, but this year, really, I think with all the other revolutions in Europe, um, they have sort of got the, uh, well, yes, the um, they have love a, for it. Yes, they have, uh, uh, as they say, jumped on the bandwagon. Mm. And uh, the, yes, the, unfortunately, um, our relation, uh, Louis-Philippe I of France, he has had to flee his country and he has taken residence um, at our behest at Clermont. Uh, which is a, um, a house um, not too far from, from Windsor. I mean, he is rather comfortable uh, despite the uh, issues that his country and his uh, people have uh, forced upon him. Uh, but yes, in between March and June this year, 1848, uh, the Chartists have begun to uh, march upon um, London and they have uh, one goal, which is um, universal suffrage, of course, only for men. Uh, they believe that um, the system that is in place, which uh, is a system that seems to work in some respects, um, is not right. And they believe that all people should be able to vote, uh, all men should be able to vote. Yes, not all people, not women. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Victoria, you, you would not approve of everybody having the vote, including women like you and I? No, I, I'm not sure that women make very good rulers. And I know that's surprising for I am a woman and I am a ruler, but um, of course, Dr. Cat, when I was born, I was not first in line to the throne. And this is a, a burden which I, which I am glad to do, but I am not a natural at it. And nor do I think that women in leadership roles, well, they are, they are not natural leaders either. It is important to do things through the proper channels. I will say that. I do not uh, envy, of course, the situation that the laboring classes have themselves in. But I believe that uh, patience and uh, support of technology will, uh, will free them from the difficulties in their life. I myself have designed a, um, a small cottage uh, for the laboring classes, uh, which uh, houses four families comfortably um, and uses ingenious techniques in order to uh, give them a, a comfortable life. And I don't think perhaps um, marching upon London is the way to do it, is my, is my point. And we have homes that you've created, will they be expensive or, or will they be affordable for them? Yes, of course. 
That is the idea. Ah, very good. Well, I mean, it must have been very difficult for you both having this potential uprising, seeing how revolutions have frequently affected people on the continent, but also, of course, in this country, members of the royal family. It's uh, not always very safe, the head that wears the crown, now is it? So yes. I expect that you'll be looking forward to celebrating this year, and I'm sure that all of my audience would like to know what your Christmas will look like, the pair of you. Well, uh, well, we have Christmas every year at Windsor, hmm. and um, and Albert, well, Albert, it's more important. Albert, uh, he really loves Christmas, and he, I suppose, he loves it more than I do. But I have loved Christmas more and more um, these past hmm. uh, married years. Yes, it seems that perhaps uh, my home country, my heritage, um, has a particular uh, affection for this time of year, perhaps because it is often much colder in, in the, the German states. And so uh, the festivals that happen in wintertime throughout the centuries have been very prized. Uh, we have very many traditions in, uh, in Germany, and uh, many of these I have brought to this great nation, uh, namely the Christmas tree. No, you have not. I... No, you have not. Uh, I mean, Victoria, everybody knows that Albert's the one that brings the Christmas tree to England. We no, all know that. I bring the Christmas no, tree to not. England. Thank you. How dare you influence people 200 years in the future that you invented the Christmas tree? Of course I did not Ridiculous. invent the Christmas no. tree. No, shush. But I brought it to no. I had a Christmas tree when I was a child, and actually my grandmother, uh, well, Queen Charlotte, she had a Christmas tree. She was one of the first people to bring the Christmas tree within her home. Yes, but you are German Liebling. This is a German tradition. Yes, but you did not eat the Christmas tree, Albert. You popularised the Christmas tree. It is very important to say it to Dr. Cat. You popularised. Yes, very well. I popularised the Christmas tree. I have brought the Christmas tree into Windsor Castle. And rather than a simple tradition of separate Christmas trees for members of the royal household, I have introduced the idea that every person can bring a tree into their home and decorate it with their families. We have placed a small image and illustration into the Illustrated London News. And uh, it has uh, rather had some success and people are starting to bring uh, Christmas trees into their homes. And I believe in the next 10, 20 years, then it will be a true English tradition rather than a tradition of a German family, you see. Yes, Albert is making it more about the family and the home. Well, perhaps if uh, these chartists see this image in the Illustrated London News, then they will see that we are not uh, threatening overlords, but a simple family in which uh, they could perhaps base their life upon, uh, an image of, um, of an ideal, perhaps. Well, I'm, I must say, um, Your Royal Highness, that I feel that you may have been quite successful because even today, that very image of you and your lovely wife, the Queen, and your children around the Christmas tree is something that is, is quite iconic. And, and in many ways, I, I think that what we have as an idea of what Christmas is comes from images like that and other things that were invented actually quite recently for you. Mm. I believe it's not long since you've had the Christmas cracker, for example. <laughs> yes. There, there is some debate, I believe, uh, upon the halls of the industrious people uh, that uh, invent such things on who did in fact invent the Christmas cracker. Mm. Yes, well, I will say it is Tom Smith, for he is the one that's put his name all over everything. And so uh, he is, uh, he's a marvellous inventor. And it was, um, well, last year, was it not? Yes, he, he, um, he seems to have acquired the, uh, the uh, patent for a, um, a bang, uh, a small strip of cardboard. Uh, with um, what is effectively black powder, gunpowder, uh, on a strip that when you pull it apart, it creates a small crack. Like this. Crack. Bang. We say crack, no? Oh. Should we say bang? Bang. 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 Just like that. And Thrilling. It's a parlor game. It is. It's, it's, it's wonderful. And there is a small confectioner's treat for Mr. Smith is a confectioner. Uh, but he seems to have taken the idea from a Mr. Brock, I believe. He is the one who has the uh, who has uh, 
who has the idea of this small piece of, of gunpowder um, made by his uh, pyrotechnician, I believe, Mr. Brown, but uh, that is by the by. Um, he has done the Victorian thing of uh, taking an idea, perhaps uh, changing it up and putting his name upon it, very industrious. <laughs> ah, yes, it's not just uh, ideas, of course, but also uh, nations that you seem to enjoy putting your name upon. But let's um, swiftly <laughs> move on, because it's not just Christmas crackers, is it? You also have uh, a wonderful tradition of carol singing we, that we know of, uh, which of course started before you, but uh, there is a carol, I believe, that uh, was invented quite recently for you. Uh, yes, yes. So once in a royal David city. Yes, once in royal David city, and so on. It uh, it is a very uh, a very beautiful uh, a beautiful song, of course. And um, you may know um, "Come, All Ye Faithful" as well. That is uh, one from, that is more recent to us. Of course, um, I have uh, brought some uh, of the uh, shamanic songs to. Uh. Uh, here yes. we go. Uh, Stille Nacht, you may know, <laughs> Silent Night, of course. And also, um, oh, Tannenbaum, oh, Tannenbaum, see choice in thine blätter. Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, how lovely are your branches. <laughs> Which you didn't invent. <laughs> <laughs> well, how wonderful. And it must be such fun for you all on Christmas Day when I'm sure you eat lots of food and open all your presents and, and spend wonderful times with your family and friends, drinking and dancing, um, being confused. Yes, open presents on Christmas Day. <laughs> <laughs> it is a yes, day of, no. uh, it is a religious day, Christmas yes. Day, not a- uh, Go not to church on Christmas Day. In mm. fact, um, well, I don't really write much in my diary what happened on Christmas Day for it's rather uneventful. We go to church in the morning, which is of course, um, Mm. Very important. Uh, sometimes the sermon's gone a bit long, but yes. uh, there we are. But no, Christmas Eve. Mm. Christmas Eve is the most uh, most thrilling part of the whole festive yes. season. That is when we open our presents. In fact, um, we have our own little tables with our own little Christmas tree next to it. And that's when we open all of our presents. Yes, we have the central family tree, of course, which I mentioned earlier, but we do have uh, individual trees that are decorated uh, with gifts and uh, small uh, confectioners treats and also gifts underneath. Of course, the Sherman tradition is to hang the present upon the tree, but with the advent of mechanization, it means that the toys are rather heavy and um, much bigger, and so they will drag the tree to the ground. <laughs> well, that is fascinating. So the way in which we place our presents under our tree is down to the size and weight of the gifts being given. Mm. That is very, very fascinating. Um, I think the other thing, of course, that has shaped our idea of what the Victorian Christmas is, is arguably somebody who is almost, I would say, your majesty, as famous as you from the period in which you live, and that is Mr. Charles Dickens, the author. Mr. Dickens. Fair enough. Yes, yes, yes. Well, when I was a young queen, I asked my prime minister at the time, Lord M, Lord Melbourne, whether I should read uh, Oliver Twist. He said, no, it would only upset me. So I read it anyway, and I discussed it all night with my courtiers, and I was amazed, really, to see uh, well, to see the reflection upon my society, which I hadn't really uh, seen before. And so, uh, Mr. Dickens, he uh, he's he's very good, mm. and, and for us, he's a he's an eye into the world that perhaps we don't see all the time. Yes, he is the pinnacle of the middle class uh, Victorian man who believes in uh, in hard work but also in charity, very important. Yes, and he's, a, he's lived a rather varied life, mm. Mr Dickens, and so he can see all walks of society as well, which uh, I suppose makes him a very good writer. Yes, did you know, Liebling, that his father was in a debtor's prison? Yes, I know, mm. terrible, terrible. But uh, as for a Christmas carol, there are there are some things that perhaps um, I, I do not recognise within our society, Albert. Uh, yes, well, uh, of course, Mr. Dickens, his great theme is to, uh, as my wife has said, the Queen, uh, to make a, a comment on society, and some of it can be rather radical. Yes, exactly. Uh, in terms of having the day off at Christmas, well, it, it won't become a, a public holiday for another 20 or so years. Mm. And so this Mr. Scrooge character, although, yes, he is rotten to the core, um, but a rather um, him allowing uh, uh, Bob Cratchit the day off was was a rather a nice gesture to begin with. Mm. 
Yes, and uh, although Liebling, I believe that uh, the arc of the story is that he is redeemed at the end. So perhaps he is not rotten all the way to the core, but there is something uh, inside of him. Uh, maybe his heart is too small or something, and uh, by the end he uh, redeems himself. But of course, with the Christmas Carol, we get the idea of the white Christmas. I mean, certainly that's how all of the images of, of the Victorian Christmas look. Snow on the window sills and people sledding and ice skating as, as you have been doing this morning, sir. And mm. surely that must be what it looks like. Well, um, actually, I think it's going to rain uh, around Christmas this year. Uh, definitely, I, I think uh, perhaps on Boxing Day it'll uh, rain then. Yes, uh, some portion of the lake is frozen over, but we do not have these uh, great uh, vast uh, winter wonderlands, as perhaps you might call it. Um, perhaps Mr. Dickens may have written this into his book, because when he was a child, uh, they had a couple of very cold winters, and that meant that it was snowy. And so he wrote from the very evocative place of one's childhood and brought uh, this idea into his books and therefore this idea into the imagination of uh, people in uh, in our time but also in the future of course. Of course it will snow uh, perhaps a bit later on and mm. some years yes it does snow but it is not always common to be snowing on Christmas. Yes unlike Mr Dickens who seems to have uh, made this idea of a, of a white Christmas uh, uh, a dream of everyone that it will be white Christmas. <laughs> So what you're telling me is that what we perhaps envisaged as a Victorian Christmas and therefore the traditional Christmas is perhaps more appropriately a Georgian Christmas. Mm. Yes, I think there are definite uh, Georgian elements, particularly when when he talks about Christmas past and he and uh, he takes you to Mr. Uh, Fezziwig's uh, Christmas party. Um, perhaps that is more like your New Year, Dr. Katz, in the time that you are from. Uh, a huge celebration with lots of different people all together, uh, dancing away. Yes, drinking rather too much. Uh, perhaps they may smoke tobacco. Perhaps they may eat rather a lot. Uh, but it is not a... Uh, a Christmas centralized around the family, more about uh, decadence. Yes, I think the traditional Christmas in which you speak is uh, perhaps a sum of its parts. Uh, but I think the idea of having the day off and coming with your family at Christmas, that is something that perhaps uh, we have tried to introduce. But a white Christmas, perhaps that is one of the past. And I imagine, uh although you will not know this, but uh, for 2020, I think our Christmas and our New Year will be somewhat more pared back. And hopefully, as we look forward to Christmas 2021, we might be looking at it being much more traditional as we understand it. Of course, one thing I, I would like to bring up before I let you go, you, you talked about your difficult year with the Chartists and you talked about the relief of that potentially being alleviated. Of course, it's not quite the same for everybody who arguably might fall under your purview because for the last few years, there has been a famine occurring in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And I wonder at this time of charity and, and Christmas spirit, what you believe you may be able to do as, well, constitutional monarchs. It is a dreadful situation in mm. Ireland and in our ministers in Parliament, they think, well, it is um, as it is God's will, there is nothing to be done. Um, and so I was meant to, to take a visit to Ireland this year. But again, they are worried that uh, these Chartists may um, or may attack me. I have had uh, some uh, some assassination attempts so far in my life and I will expect some more, I imagine. And of course, even when we escaped London to go to Osborne, there were some Chartists who followed us mm. there, uh, some 40 or so who, uh, who was intent was to come to, uh, to Osborne House, or so we thought. And so, um, and so we have to, to remain in, uh, in England uh, for the time being, but we do wish to go to Ireland and we do wish to see our, our subjects there. I have given them £2,000, which is rather a lot of money in, uh, in our time. Mm. However, as no one else is allowed to give more money than the monarch, uh, perhaps when somebody else offers a, a larger sum, say of, oh, I don't know, 
King of Turkey. The King of Turkey perhaps offers even more money. He cannot give it. Uh, for I have offered two thousand pounds, and that is the threshold. And so he will have to give lower than what I have offered. So it is. It is a difficult situation, and and perhaps we uh, we could could have tried harder. But we are we are trying our best with the information that we are being given by our ministers. Uh, you must understand that, of course, uh, there is a uh, a system in in Ireland that uh, that that works. I believe. But uh, when there is famine, we must uh, step in and try to help. Uh, my uh, great friend, um, the Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister, Sir Robert Peel, of course, he wanted to repeal the Corn Laws, which is to bring uh, uh, cheaper uh, corn and grain from elsewhere in order to help relieve the, uh, the famine, the blight that has affected the potato, which is so crucial to the Irish population. But um, unfortunately, as the Queen has said, uh, Parliament believe, well, why should we help them when this is an act of God? Um, and uh, it was rather difficult um, because of that. More importantly, of course, we are trying to step away from having a partisan view of politics as the monarch. Now, in your time, I believe uh, that perhaps your monarch has no uh, say or no power and tries very carefully to not um, make uh, judgments or um, agreements with the politics of the day. Now we are trying to find a similar uh, ground. We are, we are effectively putting the groundwork uh, for this, this idea of a true constitutional monarchy and it means we cannot do much unfortunately, to help. Um, but I believe that if uh, things um, it will improve in the future, the future will always improve things, I believe that. Yes, I think it is, it is something that we will often confuse our figureheads with people who may have power. And perhaps they have more than we believe, or perhaps they have less. And I think I have perhaps taken up enough of your time, your Royal Highnesses, and now I would like to fast forward to 2020 to meet the people who you actually are. So let's do that. And here we are, uh, back through the magic of computers and the internet. We are all joined in 2020, and I'm joined by Josh and Nadia, who are playing Albert and Victoria. And we know each other, we work together pre everything that's been going on this year, but we also work together online on Once Anonymous. And you also have another company which is Zoom Through History. So perhaps you'd like to tell us what you were doing before everything kicked off and what you've been doing now. Perfect. Yes. So thank, thank you, you so much, much Kat. Kat, for uh, letting us on uh, your YouTube channel. It's lovely channel. to be here, and hello to everyone hello out to there. Hello to everyone. So uh, first of all, Monarchs Anonymous, which of course you are the star of, the beating heart of that show. Uh, so Monarchs Anonymous really is just um, a group of all of our, our friends and creatives who, uh, because of this year, have uh, been sat at home where they should be in palaces and castles, entertaining and educating people from all over the world. So we decided uh, to bring them together online on Zoom in a programme which is about monarchs from history. We've kind of cheated. There's definitely a few non-monarchs yeah. <laughs> coming up, but it's about as a, as a rigorous therapy programme which is headed by our therapist, Dr. Kat. Uh, and it's really interesting because you get, uh, you get Queen Victoria and Prince Albert in the same room as King Henry VIII and William the Conqueror, all talking mm. about issues uh, that they've had yeah. and their opinions on things. So it's, it's really interesting and it's, um, yeah, it, uh, it doesn't hold any prisoners, let's just say that. And so it's been a really <laughs> enjoyable uh, experience and we can't wait to see where it goes. Yeah, uh, we've just started season two, which you obviously know, Kat, um, which is uh, in the editing room at the moment, uh, the first episode of that. Uh, and we had, um, I don't know how many episodes in season one, quite a few, um, eight, I think, eight episodes in season one. 
um, plus a bonus episode as well, which sort of was in between. Um, so yeah, do do check that out. It's the Monarchs Anonymous channel. If you wanna if you wanna follow that, it's uh, a channel, um, and there's all these separate little episodes, um, and they're they're about they're probably five to fifteen minutes long each episode and uh, hilarity ensues but yes yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what we were doing um before uh before lockdown i just realized that i've started speaking and the people at home will now know that i'm not german um <laughs> there we are no, you're you're not. Hair, don't I? Uh, that's real that's not a stunt beard that is your <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, so this, is, uh, this are, is real yeah <laughs> um uh, it's got to go off though. I'm playing an RAF pilot next week. But anyway, um, uh, yeah. So what we were doing before lockdown. So we um, this is back in March and 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 obviously January, and February, and, and and about three years before that, we were we were working at the historic royal palaces with you, Kat, um, in costume doing historical interpretation, which is sort of what you just saw. Really, you uh, you saw historical interpretation, uh, which is where you know people in costume um, either act out historical characters um and they uh in historic at historical sites or we could be educating or we could be um you know doing a tour but playing that historical character in that historical site that's historical interpretation and what differenti differentiates it from sort of um sort of normal acting um in a play or you know you might see uh, victoria and albert play by actors on tv is that that's not scripted what we just did that's improvised so Dr Cat asks the questions and we draw on our knowledge um, and we answer the questions um, that's that's the difference really is that it is it's is it's an improvised um, sort of uh, game if you like that's based on um, based on the research which you have to do rather a lot of um, you don't have to do as much though because Albert didn't live as long yeah that's very true I will uh... <laughs> I will, fortunately, I will obviously grow up with Victoria and so I'll be playing her. Hang on, not 42 uh, yet. In my 80s, so I'll have a lot more research to do than you will. <laughs> <laughs> but carry on. Yeah, so lockdown comes and obviously we can't do it in, in castles and, uh, and so we have to find ways to do it outside of the box, if you like. Um, obviously, Nadia mentioned Monarchs Anonymous, which is one way that we did that in our historical sitcom. Um, which was a bit different, obviously, because usually at these um, historic sites, you don't get Henry VIII and Victoria and Albert meeting each other, usually. Um, but the other thing we wanted to do is we, we wanted to, to educate and we wanted to bring historical characters on an educational platform. Um, now, we could try and go into schools, but that can be difficult as well as, you know, being at historic sites. So we uh, decided to do it as we are doing it now, Dr. Cat. Dr. Cat, I called a Dr. Cat. Excuse Dr. Cat. <laughs> It's yeah, I know you're Dr. Cat, but you know, I, I yeah, yeah. You don't call me that. In it's, like being, it's like being in Monarchs Anonymous. Um, <laughs> so zoom through history. So zoom through history is what that's called. Um, <laughs> um, Shall I take over, darling? Yeah, take over. Um, so zoom through history, as Josh said, is a historical educational company which we run. And when we first started, we just provided Victorian Albert. But as I said, we've stolen our friends to join us. Uh, to bring this history to life via Zoom. And so now we offer um, about a thousand years of history, which we're really proud of considering we literally started with, well, we lit nothing and then Victoria and Albert and now what we've got now. So it's really nice for us to kind of um, help our friends out, see our friends as well, uh, even if it's just over Zoom. And also, you know, bring that experience that you might find at a palace to, you know, students who would go on a school trip who can't do that anymore. Um, so, you know, that's what we want to do. So we offer, you know, an hour session um, with, with a Q&A, a bit like we've just done, um, about various different subjects, as Nadia says, from all the way from, from the ancient Egyptians all the way up to the Second World War um, and beyond, if you want it. You know, uh, we, can, we can offer um, sort of anything that you want, we can, we can offer it. So we can, or we can try and accommodate you. So that's that's what zoom through history is it's history through zoom effectively um, so if you are an educator or if you are a parent uh, and you have children still at home and you would like us to uh, to entertain and educate at the same time then um i'm sure dr cat will probably leave a link uh, yeah. 
description box um, so you can take a look at our new website. I think the thing that's great about it is in some ways it's far more inclusive and gives great opportunity to people all over the world than would have been able to take a trip on a given Wednesday, for example, to one of the palaces or the castles. You, you will and you have done education sessions with people in America and Canada, and you're happy to stay up late and do that. But also not just uh, schools, you're quite happy to do this for events for adults, aren't you as well? Yeah, um, recently we, we did an event um, for a, a, a group of adults and it wasn't, um, you know, it was slightly more in depth and slightly more a bit, again, a bit like what we just done. And it was about Christmas. So, um, you know, if you've got a social group or um, some sort of, um, you know, a book club, if you like, you can invite uh, historical characters into that and 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 experience their world from the comfort of your home. I mean, that's actually a really nice idea with the book club. If people are reading historical fiction, if you're re if, if your book group is reading Wolf Hall and you want Henry, well, now he can turn up for, yeah. your, for your book group. Um, well, that would be good, wouldn't it? it would, that would be, I mean, a, that's a marketing thing. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you can have that. There is. I suppose let's talk about interpretation more generally. What are your favourite things about interpreting historical figures? Big question. Big question. I think for me, obviously, when you watch someone on TV and there's that kind of... Um, there's just a there's just a gap isn't there between you and them and for me my first experience of meeting a historical character was almost like people's experience when they go to Disneyland and they see I don't know uh, someone for the first time that they've they've watched and they love mm. that was me when I met Anne Boleyn uh, for the first time as a teenager um, someone who I had kind of idolized for so many years and you know I had the bee necklace from when I was about seven um, so seeing that person in real life and and being able to to come up to her and to talk to her um, that kind of really inspired me to um, to want to do this uh, this line of work which is why I think it's so so kind of important that we can continue to do this work and it's just it's the magic really of of live theatre but even more than that because as Josh was saying earlier, the amount of research that we have to do um, to create these characters, these full rounded characters is enormous. And it's and sometimes it's really challenging and sometimes you you stumble on things and you think, oh, you know, I shouldn't have said that or whatever. But it doesn't it doesn't matter because the experience of meeting someone from the past, mm. I think, is just uh, it's just amazing, especially for us. You know, if you're a massive history geek, it's just a dream come true. Yeah. And I think I, I think that. You know, it's, it, there's an element of sort of um, of sort of it's almost like when you meet someone face to face like that and and through zoom as well you know it's there's a it's almost like meeting someone incredibly famous you know even more than celebrity you know someone historical someone iconic and you're meeting them in a very private way um, even if even if you're you're doing, you know, a Zoom call to a hundred people. You're meeting them in a way that's like you're. It makes you feel special. It's like you're special. This is what I've got to impart history. You know, this is what I've got to impart with you from history. Um, and it makes, you know, it, it's a, it's just a great way to learn that way. And I'm trying to create with Zoom through history something that the seven year old me would have just loved mm. to have a historical character come into into your school via Zoom or even in person when we're allowed to, but it would have just been my dream come true. And so I'm, 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 so I'm making the, basically my seven year olds, my seven, if I, I'm making my dream come true, essentially is what I'm saying for this, uh, for those people out there that like, were like me. Yeah. And, and me, definitely. That's, that's absolutely what I would have loved as a seven year old and a 17 year old, <laughs> and a 27 year old. Um, <laughs> you mentioned though challenges and I think, uh, we should talk about the challenges and we should talk about what it means to research somebody as historically accurately as possible and represent them as they would have appropriately behaved and thought at the time and frequently when they may have said things that we today find uncomfortable or offensive. Mm. Uh, I gave you a very difficult question at the end of 
us being you being Victoria and Albert, I, I asked you about Ireland. The way in which Victoria and Albert viewed Ireland, particularly Albert, I mean, can you talk a little bit about that? It must be somewhat uncomfortable considering how high the stakes are. Yeah, I think I think um you'll in the in the interview that we've just done, um, I said that um Albert thought that the system of Ireland worked. Now, obviously, it didn't. Obviously, um, you know, the English overlords had gained so much land from the Irish that they had, you know, such little land. That's why they were so um, so reliant on, on nutrient-rich potatoes. And obviously, when that blight happened, um, in other countries, it was bad too. In, in um, the Netherlands, for example, it was really bad as well. But it was so bad in Ireland because so much land had been taken off them since Oliver Cromwell's time and before. So um, Albert then to say it works in Ireland, um, you know, he's he's um, is how people around him would have thought and how and how he thought he's written letters saying that they just need to they just need to follow the system and it will be OK. Um, so it is difficult. And I think that, you you know, there is a duty there to make sure that you show um, to use an Oliver Cromwell expression, the warts and all, you know. Yeah. Um, but I, I think there is a thing there that we, what we do is an element of entertainment. So you can't, you can't, you've got to tread a fine line because you can't, um, you can't go too, you can't go too far and um, make the person that you're talking to not think about the history anymore or not think about the character and start thinking, actually, I'm offended now. That's, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, it's a very thin, it's, fine line. It's a fine line. I think as well, uh, in terms of Ireland, obviously in the UK, it's just not something that we, we learn about. And I think that's awful. And having um, played Victoria now for the last, you know, three or four years, that is obviously something that I've been reading into a lot more. And I think it's, I think it's terrible that we don't learn about it uh, in, in, our, in our history. And obviously we have, we have such a long history with Ireland, uh, some awful, awful mm -hmm. things that happened. Um, and so it's really important that we discuss these things with the way that they would have where the, these characters would have um, would have thought about it, and I think with Victoria particularly, she she would surround herself with people that would tell her that what she wants to hear uh, and try and you know um, like Albert, yeah, like Albert, and and avoid telling her certain things as well. So when she does go to Ireland eventually, and she arrives there, um, and and the crowds there are really friendly. Yeah, it's orchestrated. It's and so you know she thinks well people really like me and then she goes back many 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 years later after Albert's death and she is um she's called the famine queen uh, by an Irish suffragette um which again so she is the figurehead so she she will get the blame for for everything that happened um and she was definitely uh, compliant and I think they both were compliant a lot of the atrocities but I think the blame is uh, is definitely more shared than it is just at yeah. this couple I think um you know, the, we know that the reason why the Irish potato famine was not relieved in the same way, we talked a little bit about the Corn Laws, um, which Victoria and Albert wanted to repeal so that they could get more food. Um, it was, it, they basically just thought it was an act of an act of God. And, you know, there was philosophers at the time, the, a very Victorian way of thinking was, there's only so much food on the planet. And if it's bad, it's bad. You, 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 you starve. That, that's, that was a very Victorian way of thinking. Um, I, you know, I think as historical interpreters, if we want to go back to that, it's very easy to, the easy route is to go, well, let's just say all the good things about them. Um, so that the people that we meet and the people that talk, you think that you're great and it, and you know, um, and when you play characters that are dastardly, you play the sort of, uh, you know, if you're playing someone like, um, you know, with who who's typically not very nice, maybe the opinion of Richard III or something, you might play him that way in order to, um, in order to seek, you know, the, the approval of your audience almost. Um, but I think that the more the more interesting route is to is to is to be slightly more the is the grey areas. Mm. I think that's absolutely spot on. I mean, one of the things that, and lots of historical drama is guilty of it, particularly when it comes to the six wives, 
at creating these cookie cutter women, you know, the wronged wife, the temptress, the milksop, you know, the ugly one, the vixen and the nurse. And to deny their complexities, to either create them into heroes or utterly and totally wash any character out of them is deeply unfair. It does a disservice to them, but also I think it does this disservice to your audience. So yeah, there are questions about Ireland to Victoria and Albert are uncomfortable and asking them, you, you wonder how that's going to be received, but I think we have to ask them and we have to find the nuanced answer. Yeah, I think I think there's a great uh, paradox there is often that the reason why people want to learn about historical figures is because they they enjoy the cookie cutter historical figure. So we have a job with then which is giving them a little bit of that and then and mm. then and then opening the doors and they go, oh, you know, what's that like? And you go, well, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm fairly sure that there will be some comments because there has been on our monotonous videos about Victoria's reticence or actually outspoken disapproval of women getting the vote. I think that that will surprise quite a lot of people because she is a female leader. We have the assumption that she is a feminist. <laughs> that simply was not the case. Not the case at all. And there are there's lots of things about playing Victoria which are difficult for me um, because you can't always like the person that you're playing. And that's not to say that I, I dislike Victoria. That's not true at all. I think she had a lot of fine qualities and I think, you know, to survive the amount of assassination attempts that she did, to have the amount of children that she did, um, most of them without any pain relief, and to be queen at such a young age and also to have had the childhood that she did, which must have had such a severe kind of impact on her um, and her outlook on the world. You know, there's, there's so much about her that I adore and there's so much darkness there as well. But as an actor and a historical interpreter, it's not for me to comment on or to judge on um, because, you know, it's that that's that's the way that she was in that time. And it's just for me to interpret um, and particularly, yes, her opinion on um, women's rights, which she said was a wicked folly, um, you know, her opinion on, on babies and things like that. And so she's just, but that's what I love about her. Those kind of comments that are, are so, it's mm. almost, it's almost comical with how, um, with how blunt she is um, in her writings of that. And, um, and so, yeah, she's really, really interesting. And I think with any character that you play, uh, Queen Victoria or Anne Boleyn is another character that I've played a lot people have very strong opinions on them and how they should be. Like you were saying about the cutty, um, cookie, 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 that's hard, cookie cutter, cookie cutter. That is difficult. <laughs> version of them. Some people really, really want that. Mm. And so, you know, I've, I've, I've been on the, on the floor at, at work at the palaces before and had people, you know, really t testing me about yeah, things cool, yeah. or particularly as Anne Boleyn, I've, I've been really accused of having six fingers and I'm really definitely sure I had six fingers and, and trying to change that opinion is really difficult. Um, and I think yes, it's, it's a fine line to try and to try and please everyone, which of, co of course you you can't please everyone. You only have to try and play the truth of what you know and how much research you've done to to back it up. And with Victoria, obviously, there's so much research, and she has her diaries, which are great. But again, her diaries were edited uh, when she when she died by her by her daughter. So how much the diaries can you really you know believe? Um, and so I try and take my research from loads of different mm. sources and not just the diaries because obviously they are interesting but again heavily edited and how much of her opinions on women's rights and on uh, her male servants and on her opinions of her mother and all sorts of stuff were taken out. Yeah. And I mean, quite, correct me if I'm wrong as well, Nadia, because wasn't it a case that her mother is the one that gets her to write a diary as a child and then she goes through and edits it? So what does that do to an adult woman who then writes a diary when it, you know it's being read, that that was what it was for, that's how you're writing that style, and it's going to be edited to change it to be more positive? What does that do to the diary she's writing for herself as an adult? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So even uh, so she was read by two people. And so, you know, it's basically monitoring her thoughts um, completely. And then, of course, you know, uh, after after 
her, well, obviously she becomes queen, then she has a couple of really rocky years uh, of being alone, being single, uh, you know, accusing Flora Hastings of being pregnant and all of that. And, you know, so then she thinks, well, I, I need, clearly I'm not prepared to be queen because she didn't have the right um, upbringing to be queen. She, she, in my opinion anyway, um, her, her mother did in some respect have the best interests at heart, but failed really to prepare her to be to be queen because she lent on people constantly so you know then she lent on Albert and then Albert died and then she lent on on the next person and the next person mm -hmm. um so I think there's a lot of a lot of things going on there in Victoria's mind mm -hmm. uh, I, I suppose I think we've we've covered interpretation but what I want to do before we finish up is I want to ask the questions that I ask of people when I get to interview them and thank goodness for Zoom because I have really missed talking to people on this channel. First question for both of you is what inspired your interests in history respectively? So um, for me I think I was just brought up on stories from the past um, and so I have come from a big family of actors and we were constantly doing these massive long journeys from from Wales to London and in the car my mum would tell me the story of Elizabeth Woodville and I just thought it was you know fairy tales and as I grew up I realised that she was uh, <laughs> that she was basically just being a big geek in the car and just wanted to have someone to have that interest with and I was just obsessed really from being very very little and as I mentioned earlier I went to Hampton Court Palace and met Anne Boleyn in real life and that really just um, took me on this road to where I am now really. I think also, I'm going to embarrass myself now, so strap yourselves in. Um, I used to love, like, um, as a kid, I used to love dressing up. I used to love um, the uh, the experience of what costume. Uh, I'm an actor as well, so that sort of fed into that as well. But the, the feeling of costume and what that does to um, an actor, and also when you're trying to, when you're a kid and you're thinking of your imaginary imaginary world one of the the ways into that was through costume so when you know when this job came along it's 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 really brilliant and I think um you know that that really sparks an interest in stepping into literally stepping into someone else's shoes I think and more generally thinking about the state of the world state of education politics whatever you however you want to approach this question what do you think is important about an understanding of history? Why is it valuable? I think certainly for us at Zoom Through History um, and part of the sort of ethos of that um, is I think it's very easy to, a bit like that cookie cutter sort of thing, to go, right, the Romans, and that's a period of history. And then you have your next period of history and then your next period of history. But I think what's really exciting about learning about history is you see that everything is into it's a web and everything's interlinked and every single historical period, you know, runs into each other. You know, sometimes people forget. I know that I do that. I'm sure that your viewers don't because um, uh, the, the Tudors is such a popular period. But sometimes people forget uh, that, you know, Elizabeth I is Anne Boleyn's daughter and that they're only connected by one generation. Um, and that Anne Boleyn was Henry VIII's wife, and you know all that. You know, you think of um, Shakespeare and the Elizabethans as one historical section that's very neat, and then the Henrician period and Henry VIII is another one. Mm -hmm. But everything's interlinked, and then that links to the to the Stuarts, and the Stuarts into the, the Civil War, which is Charles II and the Great Fire of London, and then into the you know the sixth the um, the Glorious Revolution, and then the Georgians, mm -hmm. and how it's all just a river that keeps going. Um, but that is that river is still flowing to use a metaphor is still flowing now and and how everything connects to now you know I think that's particularly that. this year we are living through one of the biggest historical events you know um you know yesterday the vaccine came and you know William Shakespeare had the vaccine yeah. that is a historical event and so the best thing about history is that it isn't history it's present and it's you know it's ongoing yeah. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really that's a really lovely way of thinking about it and putting it that I, I I made a video actually on the way we partition up history and how ultimately it's it's sort of arbitrary. And we talked about it in the first part of this video where we think about Charles Dickens as this 
archetypal Victorian author, but arguably so much of the world he shapes, where his imagination is is being fostered, is in his own childhood, which is distinctly Georgian. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, Fascinating. And the same with Victoria as well. I mean, when you think Queen Victoria, maybe not in as uh, in the modern, uh, in the more uh, recent past when certain um, television programs and films have been made, but certainly the image of Queen Victoria that's lasting is an old woman who's a widow um, and the young, vibrant, politically charged queen is, um, is sometimes forgotten and how important the birth of constitutional monarchy is um, in her early reign. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much. And as always, we will be looking forward to reading all of your conversation in the comment section underneath this video. And perhaps you lovelies will be there uh, filling in and answering some things if you can. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, then please let me know by hitting the thumbs up. Please also subscribe to this channel. And while you're there, why not hit the notification bell beside the subscribe button so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. We all hope that you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing, and look forward to seeing you either on this channel or on Monarchs Anonymous, or maybe on Zoom through history. Whatever you're doing, do take care of yourself. And I look forward to speaking to you all next time. Bye-bye for now.